Chaotic malformations of the brainstem. All over to you, Dr. Morcos. Thank you. Can you see my slide and hear me? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Let me see. I will, I think I will try to make up time on this one. I hate to keep people waiting too long. Uh, my disclosures, which I forgot to put in the previous one, are completely irrelevant uh, to, to anything I'm saying. Uh, uh, we are an inter. I, I, I want to put a plug for this because, uh, you know, I, 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 I am an international person. Uh, all of us, I am sure, hate racism. And I put my thoughts about racism in a recent publication. I encourage you and I, I encourage you to read it, not so much so you read my essay, but I want to encourage all of you to write similar positive stories, because I am sure each one of you has something to say about what's going on in the world today, about racism and, and many other things. So read it so that I can stimulate you to write, either in social media or in, in, in scientific publications like the JNS, uh, your thoughts. Okay, brainstem cavernomas. Here is what I'm going to try to cover. Anatomy, surgical principles, and case examples. I'm going to go fast. Anatomy, this is a brain stem, but here is how I want you to think about the brain stem. Cross-sectional, I'm going to talk about those six uh, cross-sections, medulla, pons, and midbrain. And these are schematics, and I, of course we have no time to go over details, uh, but this is the rostral midbrain. It's a very busy area. This is the caudal midbrain, a little, bit, a little bit less busy. Here is the pons, and thankfully most cavernomas, 60% of them are, of the brainstem are in the pons, and we have more room to work in the pons, and that's why that is where the best uh, surgical results are. Here is the caudal pons, also extra room at the transverse fibers. The medulla is dense, dense with very important uh, nuclei and fibers, caudal and rostral medulla. Again, uh, you, can, you will appreciate that I have no time to go over anatomical details. We have to thank Albino Bricolo to think of the concept of safe entry zones. Now this is, as I will show you later, a treacherous concept, but it is useful at least to understand it a little bit. This was adapted and many future authors after him adapted the safe entry zones based on his thinking uh, originally. This is from uh, a Kalani and Spetzler's paper, pictures I have taken to tell you what I think is reasonable safe entry zones and what I think are not reasonable entry zones. In the midbrain, the anterior medial zone is reasonable, medial to the corticospinal tracts. The dorsal intercollicular zone is reasonable, uh, you can, let me move the panel thing, the lateral medullary sulcus, uh, I'm sorry, lateral mesencephalic sulcus is a very good safe entry zone. Uh, now, what I don't think is a good entry zone, which was in that paper, and I've put them in orange, midline of the pons or uh, the between MLFs in the midline of the fourth ventricle that's a terrible, I mean, I, I definitely would avoid using incisions between the two MLFs. The peritrigeminal zone and the lower trigeminal zone uh, is excellent. These three dots here, excellent entries to the lateral pons. The medulla, you can, I do, I, I do not agree that the anterior medulla is a good entry zone, even if you're between the two pyramids. And uh, uh, the olive, is not, I mean, is a good entry zone, and the lateral medullary zone and the posterior midline sulcus is a good entry zone. So that's it. That's in general your entry zone. You put them all together, and here are all the arrows uh, for each section of the brain stem. 
to, to think about. And so you have this at the back of your mind when you try to think of all the approaches you can use. And there are many. Uh, he, I'm not going to name each one of them. I'm going to give you examples as I go through the talk. But you have to adapt the approach to where you are, want to end up in the brainstem. So this brings us to surgical principles. And particularly for the younger people in the audience, I really want you, if you forget the rest of my talk, I want you to please appreciate the coming two or three slides. The rest is going to be case examples. But here is, here is the principle. What are your goals of surgery? That's the conceptual reasoning when you approach a brainstem cavernoma. What are the strategies that meet these goals? That's your analytical planning. And last is your tactics. How do you execute to achieve your strategies that will achieve your goals? So I'm putting it here all in a table. And, and, uh, and I think this, this slide is probably the most important slide of the whole talk. There are four steps. Goals. How do you get there? How do you find the cavernoma? You need to leave no trace, like a burglar, of you being there, and you need to resect it completely. How do, you, how do you get there? Strategically, you need to understand the surface geometry. To find it, you need depth geometry. To leave no trace, you need an optimal intraaxial neural path. To resect it completely, this is where your quote-unquote surgical skill and surgical ergonomics uh, uh, get into it. Uh, I'm not going to read all the tactics, but you can read each group of tactics that will satisfy each strategy. Uh, I will come back to it. I, it's it's going to be boring if I read all this to you. Just have a quick look, read at it, read it yourself. You'll you'll know what I mean, and I will come back to it. Okay. Here is another very important slide. This one and the next one. What, uh, this is mistakes I have made in my 25 years of practice and, what I, and, and, and mistakes I've seen others make and I've learned from them uh, with brainstem cavernoma. First mistake, not knowing when not to operate, meaning being inappropriately aggressive. Second mistake, missing the opportunity to, uh, uh, to operate, meaning being inappropriately conservative. Other mistake, anatomy does not mean pathology. So the concept of safe entry zones I just showed you is meaningless when there is a lesion in the brainstem that has distorted the anatomy and given, given you a new path if it reaches the surface. Next mistake, favorable geometry does not mean favorable physiology. I don't know if some of you are familiar with this old paper from 1996 by Adam Brown, and who was my co-fellow when I was with Spetzler, by Brown and Spetzler, the two-point method. I mean, it's, it's, of course, a simple way to look at it. Where is the surface of the lesion? Where is the center of the lesion? Draw a line, and that should be your approach. Well, that works a lot of the time, but should not work all the time, particularly when you're in the fourth ventricle, and I will come back to that later. It's a nice starting point. Next, next mistake I've learned, that if you don't execute step one or step two that I showed you in the table earlier, if you don't execute them well, step three and step four will, will suffer. If you have to choose if step two and step three give you two contradictory conclusions as to what approach you should use, Always favor what step three tells you. So if you go back to my table, you will know what I mean. Always compromise in favor of step three. Now, we all say cavernomas are mulberries. They're not, uh, yeah, fine, mulberries may be okay, but I like to think of them as red cauliflowers. Why is that important? Because you know how cauliflowers have protruding parts. These parts are very easy to miss hidden, buried in the brainstem. That's where the problem is with leaving residuals after surgery. Next mistake, and, I, and I'm, I mean what I say, please take the small vein of the cavernoma when you remove the cavernoma. And I mean it. 
I don't mean take the developmental venous anomaly. I, don't, I am not saying take the DVA. I am saying there is almost always a small vein draining the cavernoma into a DVA. Take the vein, but pre, uh, preserve the DVA. If you don't take the vein, and I've had about three cases of recurrences because the small vein can act as an idus for recurrence of a cavernoma. So that's, please make attention, pay attention. I'm not saying take the DVA. You can have an infarct if you take a big DVA. Radio surgery does not work for cavernoma. That's all I'm gonna say. I, I have a lot of data to back it up. I have colleagues from Sweden that have data to back it up. That's all I'm gonna say. It does not work. Do not use it, certainly for brainstem cavernomas. Surgical principles. Okay, you open any paper on brainstem cavernomas, you see a list of surgical approaches, or you see a list of target areas in the brainstem and what approaches. You can look at it both ways, and you should look at it both ways to understand. You, either you list, let's say, mesencephalon and what approaches are good for it, or you say frontoorbitozygomatic approach, what targets can it get you? You, you have to do that in your mind anyway, both ways to fully understand it. So that probably that paper is probably, uh, I assume, still the largest series of brainstem cavernomas, about 400 of Spetzler. But you know, even in the hands of Spetzler, the results could still be improved. New deficits, 53%. Uh, post-op rehemorrhage, 8%. New post-op deficits, 35%. We can cert we when I say we meaning all of us can certainly do better. A meta-analysis of the literature showed similar things. In even in very good hands, uh, the morbidity is is not negligible. Can be significant. You can see the numbers highlighted in yellow. So we we must do better. We owe Dr. Roten an immense debt of gratitude for teaching us anatomy, and I'm going to use his dissections to show you some of the common approaches. The COZ, Transylvian approach, it gets you to this part of the midbrain. The Transylvian pretemporal approach gets you to this part with or without transtentorial. The Kawazi approach, which I like very much, properly chosen, gets you to the upper part of the pons but not below seven and eighth nerve. Please remember that lower limit. Seven and eighth nerve is the lowest limit of Kawazi approach. Supracerebellar infratentorial, it has three variants. And I love the paramedian or the extreme lateral variant of it, I, uh, much more than the midline variant, because that is where the tentorium is flat. Very good approach. The posterior interhemispheric transtentorial, is useful sometimes, but please don't do it the way Roten described it, which is in the uh, prone position, then you have to put a retractor on the occipital lobe. No, turn the patient 90 degree, don't put a retractor and allow gravity and the lumbar drain to allow the occipital lobe to fall away from the forks. That's how I do uh, uh, interhemispheric transtentorial approach. Uh, Midline suboccipital telovelar, if you must enter the floor of the fourth ventricle. Of course, retrosigmoid gets you here. And uh, uh, pre-sigmoid, that's rare, but sometimes it is useful if that's the only way to get there. Pre-sigmoid combined subtemporal, it's very rare for brainstem cavernoma. It's much more useful for big meningiomas of this area. And of course, the far lateral gets you to the lower third of the pons and of course, enterolateral medulla. So the rest of the talk is case examples and show you what I chose and what reason I chose what I did. Decision-making and technical. Let's start from the top, midbrain, go down to the medulla, and, and please somebody tell me maybe five minutes before you want me to stop. I, I, I really don't want to go too much over time. A midbrain. Uh, Let's start with this thalamomesencephalic cavernoma, where I used the posterior interhemispheric approach. Uh, I'm, I'm going to skip some details. 
uh, except the irrelevant ones. This patient was treated elsewhere with cyber knife, 50 year old female. She got worse. This is her MRI and I'll show you the video. Uh, look at this lesion. How on earth would you use cyber knife radio surgery for this lesion? The patient worsened after the cyber knife. What approach did I use? Uh, uh, the posterior interhemispheric in this case because the tentorium was very steep. Here is the approach we used. Notice how the patient is in the horizontal position with the lumbar drain. Uh, I took one vein, bridging vein. I uh, cut the tentorium in the depth. Be very careful. You can confuse where the straight sinus is and it's not always easy to see. It's not always blue. Use navigation if you need to to find, identify and preserve the straight sinus at the junction between folks and tentorium. Then I am opening the tentorium. I like to open it, not from the edge at the incisura, but from the middle of it going towards the edge. And we're gonna look for the fourth nerve. And here is a beautiful view of vein of Rosenthal, the precentral cerebellar vein. And of course you want to save all that. Now. You will notice I have no retractor, not even on the faults. Sometimes you can put a retractor on the faults, like I, I can't remember honestly if I did or not on this case, but certainly no retractor on the brain. Uh, yes, I did put a retractor on the faults, not on the brain. Here is a pineal gland. The lesion is above the, my entry point. I don't want to enter through superior colliculus, so I entered through the pineal gland with the use of intra-op navigation. And look at the view, perfect angle into the cavity of the cavernoma to resect it. So here is a transpineal gland entry from the interhemispheric approach and removing the cavernoma. Uh, as you know, these videos of cavernomas, they all look alike after a while. Resecting the cavernoma is a standard technique. You you can do it piecemeal if you have to. I generally avoid it unless it's very large. So, and here is at the end, look how nice the brain is. Cavernoma completely out. Here is a post-op hemosiderin ring. And the cavernoma is out. Uh, I, look how steep the tentorium is. You see why I chose the posterior interhemispheric approach. Next example of the midbrain. Caudal midbrain, I'm going to show you an example of supracerebellar, infratentorial, extreme lateral approach. I don't like the sitting position. I like the concord position. By the way, this patient was treated elsewhere through what I believe to be the wrong approach. I'll show you why. They did telovelar approach and removed a small piece of the cavernoma, encountered a DVA, and backed out. Again, young woman fourth nerve palsy, left hemiparesis, had a hemorrhage in this cavernoma. So you see, you see why you can, I hope you can see why the telovelar approach would be the wrong approach here uh, when you have the supracerebellar infratentorial. The other surgeon knew the, of the DVA but still chose to come in. It's a long reach from below. <clears throat> Look at the DVA on angiogram. He removed part of it and backed out. That's post-op after that first surgery elsewhere. Patient did a good, had a good recovery and was uh, referred to me. And uh, this is six months later, and I chose the supracerebellar infratentorial, much better approach. And I'm gonna show you the operative view of that approach. It's really so simple, concord position, infratentorial, look at it. I'm looking, I haven't cut any brain tissue yet, and I'm looking at the cavernoma below the fourth nerve. This is cerebellum and this is SCA. All I have to do is just work on either side of the SCA. Look at the beautiful discoloration. Here is the fourth nerve. I will be eventually moving it up to work on either side of the SCA no retractor on the cerebellum. Uh, you obtain CSF drainage either 
from above cisterna magna or a lumbar drain or both. I like to use bipolar coterie to shrink some cavernomas if they are, if I think I can gain room to do, to, to, to resect them. And that's what I did here. And And again, I'm gonna skip through some of those steps, but you can see once you develop a plane, stick with it. And remember the cauliflower analogy. And here is uh, most of the piece coming out. You notice how I use my sucker as a dissector. It's a blunt sucker. This is a gliotic plane. And then when you're finished, very meticulous analysis of the walls to make sure it's good. And uh, cerebellum looks excellent. Uh, she, I did give her a temporary fourth nerve palsy after four and a half weeks, recovered completely. This is the approach. Here is a post-op MRI. You can see why this approach was the perfect angle of approach. Uh, you see the approach compared to the previous one, which was Tilo Wheeler. You can see the intact DVA post -op. Let's go to the pons. Um, rostral pons. Okay, pregnant woman, I'll show you, I'm not gonna read all this, had, uh, this is her third pregnancy. She lives in Panama and she bled from during pregnancy. Notice they treated her just with steroids She's become cushionoid from the steroids they gave her. She's in a wheelchair due to the myopathy and this huge cavernoma. So you might look at this cavernoma and she's transferred to me. You might say, oh, you have to go through the floor of the fourth ventricle, but she has normal facial nerve. It would be a mistake to go through the floor of the fourth ventricle. A much better approach is a subtemporal approach. Very simple. And uh, this gets you there, and that's what I did. We analyze. Uh, here is the fetal monitoring. She was, uh, I believe, 27 or 28 weeks pregnant, and we're monitoring the fetus. Simple approach, subtemporal. You can hear the fetus, and uh, here is post-op. Uh, excellent uh, resection. She she improved. Of course, I stopped her steroids. This is post-op day one. Uh, eye movements out. are good. Look at leg that was weak is already stronger post of day one. I know there was audio to this, but I, I, you can still hear me, can you? I did not mute myself. Okay. Uh, another example. Pontum is encephalic cavernoma. This case I did subtemporal, transtentorial. I'll go quickly through this video that's narrated and is now published, but. Uh, narrated by my former fellow, George Zenonos. Here is the lesion. You can see why I chose subtemporal. This is the anatomy that you have to think about. Here is the hematoma. You have the choices of approach. And we chose simple subtemporal. The most medial one had to be sacrificed to the trochlear nerve. Here is a tentorium being split. Further increase the exposure. This is, a, a, I also cut, cut the artery of Davidoff and Schechter. The tentorium can then be reflected and secured with a mannerism foot. That's a trick I learned from Hernis Niami, holding the tentorium with a clip. The surface of the brain stem is stimulated to ensure absence of aberrant problems. You stimulate to find a safe entry zone. A small opening in the epitrigeminal entry zone. Epitrigeminal entry zone. Then cavernoma is removed. I'm not going to show you that. A bone flap put back. Look at the post-op, complete resection. A caudal pons. A use of Kawase approach for a lower pontine cavernoma. A this is a familial case of cavernoma. I'm going to show you. Look at her cavernoma in the right pons, how it used to be. I operated on her sister also with brainstem cavernomas. And look what happened to this cavernoma over time. Growing, growing, reaching the lateral surface. 
and look at the view now. So now you wonder how should you enter the brainstem? Well, I did tractography, DTI. It showed me where the white arrow is that there are no cortical uh, spinal fibers laterally in the pons. So that's why I came laterally through a subtemporal kawasi anterior petrosectomy approach. So here is the approach. You drill extradurally the petrous apex. That's why, you know, most open vascular surgeons need to be also skull based surgeons and the other way around if we're going to be able to offer our patients everything we need to offer them. So I'm not going to bore you with the Kawazi drilling. Uh, you do that. Then you open the tentorium. And I have a great view now. Look at the fourth nerve, third nerve. I have a view of the lateral pons. As I told you earlier, do not use this approach if you need to get below seven and eight. This approach is only good down to seven and eight. You notice that nice drill that I use. It's a curved, low-profile drill. Perfect angle to enter the cavernoma. Same technique. And at the end, please notice that what bone I drilled, the anterior petrosectomy. You notice fat graft. Look at the angle of view. Excellent angle of view for where the cavernoma was. That's post-op day one or post-op day two MRI. Here she is doing excellent immediately post, I mean, a day or two post-op. Here she is six weeks post-op. Um, Caudal pons, another example. You have to know how to use the far lateral approach. You use it many times. Another video recently narrated by my, again, former fellow, Georgios Zenonos, who is now in Pittsburgh. Uh, here is the lesion. Look where it is. You could choose, what could you choose? Retrosigmoid or far lateral approach? The reason I chose far lateral approach is because of this coronal view. You see, it's dangling at the bottom of the pond. So far lateral gives you a better angle. You see the arrow I'm showing here? Better angle of view from caudal to cranial. And here is another view with the kiss sequence. Here we are studying the anatomy, the fibers, uh, dissection fibers. And here is how I, I like to do the far lateral. And I'll show you what the entry zone is. Look at that, so easy. It's almost on the surface, working between six nerve medially, seventh and eighth nerve laterally, and only the far lateral angle gives you that view. And then gentle pulling, cutting, traction, counter traction. I use micro pituitary rongeur or smaller instrument, and you have to tease it with the sucker giving counter traction. Very important to analyze the cavity when you finish. And here is when we finish, the cerebellum looks good. Uh, I think I'm, uh, I'm gonna skip this one. I'm gonna skip this one. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna skip that. Uh, this, uh, this is a teaching case. Okay. Again, you learn from mistake. This patient was treated at another center by a very qualified, very skilled vascular surgeon. He treated this cavernoma by going through the floor of the fourth ventricle when the cavernoma grew. See, I would never do that. There is too much brain tissue to do a telovelar approach. The patient had a bad outcome, uh, peripheral facial palsy. She was in ICU apparently for several weeks made a partial recovery, she had some hemiparesis, and there was a residual cavernoma. And that residual cavernoma grew back, and now she comes to me with this cavernoma. So here is now how she is. She has a partial, not a complete, a partial facial palsy, mild hemiparesis, and now she's losing hearing. How would you approach this? Would you go back through the telovelar approach floor of the fourth ventricle, or would you do what I did, which is what I call choosing the, less, the path less traveled 
far lateral go through more of the middle cerebellar peduncle, even though it is contrary to the two-point method. That's what you should do, because that's a safer way. I don't have time to show you each one of her MRI slices, but I did a far lateral approach, not uh, going through the old approach. My uh, view is here. Here is navigation. You go through the middle cerebellar peduncle. That's a view at surgery. Uh, I'm not going to show you the video. It'll take too long. I'll skip it. When should uh, and at the end, removed it completely. She did not turn a hair, unlike her first surgery, because this is a much better tolerated approach. That's post-op. I saved her DVA. Please remember that principle. One of the mistakes I put in my first slides is choose sometimes the path less traveled. Uh, I think I'll finish. Well, maybe I can show one medulla example. I'll skip this other pontine cavernoma. I'll show one medulla example of using the suprafacial. Here, in this case, you have no choice. It's exophytic in the fourth ventricle. It's too much brain to come far lateral. You have to go through the floor of the fourth ventricle, but you have to do telovelar approach, and you have to do intraoperative mapping. And that's what I did on a case. Uh, I'll show you just a brief portion of the video. Oh, sorry, that's another case, but I'm doing intra-op mapping with the stimulation to know where the facial colliculus is. I'm in the floor of the fourth ventricle. And once you map it, uh, sorry, this video is bad quality, uh, you take it out. Uh, so, but it's, I don't like this approach. I only use it if it's the only way to get to the cavernoma. Uh, these are some references from our center regarding brainstem cavernoma. Uh, feel free to reach me on Twitter for questions or my email. And this is the link to the various uh, Wednesday and Thursday symposium that we do every week. Uh, I think we're going to keep going till December. It's been very popular on all aspects of vascular, skull base, and brain tumor surgery. My partner, Mike Ivan, runs the Wednesday session and I run the Thursday session. Thank you very much. Okay, Sam. So, uh, go ahead, Sam. Hello? Okay, see. We can start the discussion for uh, what you want. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sam. It was a great uh, presentation, Dr. Jocks. And uh, I think that these are great teachers and the great surgeons who make things simple for the others. And you give us, you give us a lot of tips and very useful uh, things and also showed us how your technique and how your and, uh, thinking, thinking is different uh, from others. Uh, I like the statement when you said you sometimes you have to choose the path which is less traveled. So with this, I'd like to open uh, for discussion. Uh, is there any questions from our panelists or uh, I don't see any, any question in the chat box right now. I would just repeat uh, Dr. Goel's uh, question yesterday, yesterday's question in which he asked, uh, what is your experience regarding the uh, recurrence and recurrence of cavernomas, sorry, the residual cavernomas if you have left and what would be your strategy when you find that you have left residue? You're asking Atul, yes? No, no, that was not Atul's question, but I'm putting it up to you. Oh, oh sorry, okay. Uh, well, if I left a cavernoma, not knowing that I left a cavernoma, I always do a post-op MRI, post-op day one, uh, it's, it's rare to be honest, but I would go back in and remove it. But I, I, I may have done this once maybe. Uh, if I left a cavernoma, on, it's usually on purpose because of change in intra-op monitoring, uh, uh, then I'm obviously not gonna do anything about it and wait for it to regrow and reach a safer surface representation of the brainstem for me to come back perhaps through another approach. That's, that's, that's again an interesting uh, Mark, strategy. Uh, I, I have a question. Uh, 
when you have a, a, a brainstem cavernoma, let's say a pontine cavernoma presented with a, with a hemorrhage, not just oozing a hemorrhage, do you prefer to operate on them acutely or let them recover and then operate? If the deficit is huge, Pascal, and if in my mind the size of the hematoma explains it, it's like complete hemiplegia or, or not breathing well, needing a ventilator, I would operate acutely. But that's usually, as you know, rather rare. Otherwise, I usually wait, depending on volume of blood, anywhere from two to six weeks, because we all want that engine oil cushion around the cavernoma when we go in. And uh, as you know, they get better as you're waiting, plus you get nice uh, engine oil to save the day. Absolutely. So we hand over to you, Dr. Sami. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank Marcos. You. It was enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Yeah, dear uh, professors, uh, mentors, uh, thank you for uh, these uh, nice, magnificent uh, liquid shows. We have uh, two uh, long days. My word is with, when I said it was the century event, not described this marathon of speakers, moderators, and organizers. I thank you all for your collaboration with uh, Ewan's Academy and invite you all for our next event at 19 and 20 September 2020 about Egyptian and World Neurosurgeon Community Academy Endoscopic Spine Congress. Thank you all for giving us this nice lectures that we all we all learned from it a lot. And thanks for honor of accepting our invitation. It was a highly prestigious ceremony. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And It'll be edited and it's all recorded on YouTube. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.